Why? Why are you getting in my way? Pierce's activity has brought new rumors to the boards about the hulking PC having fallen asleep. Considering a few days had to have passed, that he's been there the entire time says wonders about his resolve towards this. I think I established how much I didn't like Pyrrhus in the original games, but damn does this version show the strength of his character. Bring him on in the investigation! I know I explore alternate possibilities often on this show. The reason they've not popped up much this time is because of inevitability. The characters are so well developed from such little given, it is a rarity you can see legitimate alternate paths for them. Someone would need to be changed to accommodate it, and the easiest to do it would be to Haseo, but that would throw his development and the rest of the story off right now. I'll be getting into the original story eventually with the novels, but this is also brilliantly balanced, leading from point to point organically. For example, because Haseo is there checking on Pyrrhus, He's there to witness Sakaki bringing Adelie there so she can hear the sound that reverberates from beyond the system boundaries. He's searching for something and using Adelie to get to it. And worse, she is so devoted to the man she's been betraying Haseo's trust all along. For a man who already finds it difficult to trust, it's surprising he doesn't react more volatilely to this revelation. We get an email confirming that Kuhn's the opponent for the last match, along with his team, Thunderstorm. Sorry, man, but even in what I think is your best role, you can't escape it. But now is a good time to level before that. We're at level 35 by this point, and a few more quests have spawned. One in particular brings us into rivalry with Matsu for the quest item. However, he's also on patrol for PKs, which Haseo runs into instead. A fact that's brought up to him when they both arrive at the end of the dungeon at the same time. Shouldn't the quest item respawn after a little while? I mean... That's how MMOs work, right? The idea is broached to settle it in a duel, which is different from PKing, as like the arena, both sides consent to fight, but then the PK's boss appears. It's Negimaru, who's talking like he's a big shot until he sees who he has to fight. From his time with Team Only One Target, most would think he's a talentless mook. He is, but he still tries to strike out on his own and make something of himself especially since Bordeaux sequestered herself since the arena battle. He's trying to fill the void, but the only thing he knows is PKing. He tries to bash some skulls, but even without the avatar, Haseo can put him in his place. And since Haseo had to do the job, Matsu lets him have the quest item as compensation. It's another reason why I like the side quests the game generates. It gives us looks into these other characters. Hell, there's a quest I skipped over that became available earlier, due to story progression making it lost in the shuffle as priority locks out some of the side stuff, where Pyrrhus and company encounter a player who's a struggling artist with the case of the Bloods. Because he's been there, and between his eccentricities and leading by example actually helps to cheer the guy up. Again, why I like Pyrrhus III over Pyrrhus Classic. It similarly inspires Gaspard, as after being harassed by Bordeaux, he likewise needed that encouragement. Anyways, it's time for the final match with Kuhn, and Syllabus is appropriately nervous. After all, it's his friend and former guildmaster. It's Kuhn, right? Knowing him, he might just lose to us on purpose. How do you know that? I mean, yeah, he quits stuff instead of finishing it all the time, but that's known to the audience, not the characters. However, this is where things come to a head. As I've been stressing, Haseo's been seeking power for so long, now that he has it, he needs validation of it. And what better validation than those that previously shunned him for lacking it? Coupled with the last match where he's now committed to win at any cost... And Terrace? It's one that leads to disaster, as he sees this as yet another betrayal. What I've been trying to show with my ongoing character analysis, and likely failing, is this entire situation is a compounding of errors. While I've tried to fall on Haseo's side, as he is the viewpoint character, everybody's refusal to talk this out, without pretense, without ego, without manipulation, is the problem. 
Aseo has this chip on his shoulder, feeling entitled as he's been fighting for so long alone. He refuses to trust. Pai is transpositioning her own issues, and Kun has no interest in anything that doesn't cross a moral boundary, and Terrace is just seeking to prove a point. But the arena battles have shown Haseo needs different things to truly succeed in his journey. Ruthlessness, variety, conviction to do what must be done, and allies he can trust. But that last is faltering, because every potential one... Why? Why do all of you keep getting in my way? He's become so focused on himself, on Shino, that he can't see anyone else's viewpoint. He can't understand what they're trying to say. For is this not what they needed from him? He's useful now. Why do they fight him? They have the same goal, don't they? But because of that selfishness. Else, you alive! He gives into scathe. And that was a mistake. Kuhn calls Magus and we enter another avatar battle. Magus can create energy barriers, shoot multiple beams you need to dodge, and propagate independent drones that must be destroyed. However, the reason this was a mistake is the epitaph's power feeds on emotion, raw, unbridled. The more they're given, the more they can take. That was their purpose, to intake and analyze the various aspects of humanity. And when someone loses control, someone they are bound to, they rampage. And Scaith breaks free. For this is what Hisao wanted, isn't it? Isn't it? Every enemy fallen, their life taken, their power devoured, no one strong enough to challenge the Reaper, the realm beyond destroyed if she wasn't there. No. No, it wasn't. It was always a means to an end. Salvation can only come through destruction, but there are many ways to destroy. An enemy is destroyed when they become my friend. And all Haseo sees anymore is enemies. So all Skate can do is kill. Do you understand now? Avatars amplify the dark side of our hearts. That is not something that can easily be overcome. You should always be prepared to lose something that is precious to you. I'm sorry, but this was the only way I could think of. These battles have all taught Haseo different things. This battle was about control, and Scaife devours a second phase. You used the ability of propagation, didn't you? There are a few ways to interpret that. That the entire Avatar battle from the moment Haseo lost control was an elaborate simulation. That Kuhn created clone data of Magus from the beginning of the battle, or to avoid a direct data drain when he was protect broken, he did a copy then. And I really don't like the first interpretation. I like to view it as Haseo legitimately screwing up. For this was an important step for him as a person. That you can't just push people away because they don't agree with you. Ignore them. Treat them as less than worthy of your attention because they won't do as you say. I like to see him crying out as Scape does that act, as him collapsing in grief at a moment of epiphany. His actions are not as justified as he tells himself they are. But one thing is for certain. Because of this, he will never allow himself to lose control again. Kuhn gives up, so next is the title match against Endrance. Yada calls Haseo to Raven, and the three active epitaphs more or less make up, reverting to the expected status quo, and Yada giving up details on Endrance. Endrance is a player with many mysteries. You fought with him seven years ago. You have personally encountered the past incarnation of his epitaph and have either witnessed or know of the bond the two shared. Did you really not consider this at all? You know, Pi manipulates people by withholding information. Yada unintentionally does it because it's not part of the world he doesn't consider relevant. Now one could say that this wasn't meant to be connected in the manner they intended with the original games. 
After all, they didn't bring back any of the principal players from those events, only secondary or supporting characters who effectively stay in similar roles and may not have interacted at all if not through Kites and Black Rose. And that's true. However, the question remains unanswered why Yadot either did not know or did not decide to use that information to his advantage. Anyways, a few quests are open at the shop, most notably involving Pai and Kuhn, which allows for a bit of non-mission bonding time with the pair. Hey, you're and also deal with the lingering issue of Alcade hating Haseo's guts. After all, you can't have a potential love interest despising the guts of the intended. Um, yeah, about that. There's an event near the end of these games which pretty much gives... Well, let's just say Mass Effect was not the first game to utilize multiple choice love interests. While there is an official pairing, Alcade, amongst the fanbase, is one of the most commonly shipped female characters with Haseo. Help it with her general popularity, it's not that unreasonable. Essentially, the quest allows the two to repair their interactions with each other while also allowing Pi some development as she comes down on Haseo's side. Somewhat. More or less pointing out Alcade's own ego enforced hypocrisy in that she knows nothing about him. Also good for strengthening their relationship. It's resolved when, after Alcade's party abandons her, they come to her rescue. Though sadly, Alcade's still a Sundere about that, wanting to earn her victory over him. Kuhn's quest is of less story importance, just more of him being a shameless flirt and helping out a newbie player with getting some validation from her friends. And he is of course shot down because she is far, far younger than him. This is what happens when you use an online game to pick up dates. Even more, when you already have women fawning over you. Seriously, stop while you're ahead, dude. We're approaching the end game, so I really should address two additional events. The first is the doppelganger. If you spend enough time in any field area, you'll eventually come across a black, glowing clone of Haseo's player character, job classes and all. What's difficult about him is he has special rare equipment, regenerates his own health, and has 8 levels on you at all times. The only exception is when you hit the level cap, as it's limited from becoming stronger, and you are most likely to know most if not all of the game's skills by that point. He also doesn't get boosts from any stat improvement books or buffs from Harvest Clerics. While you can just wail at him with the advantage of it being 3 on 1, there is a far easier way to kill it. And it involves the Sleep Near strategy. Which is to go to a field that has the Sleep Near, clear out every other monster in said field, kick Sleep Near so you get its party assist, and then attack the Doppelganger. Sleep Near will cut its HP in half. Then, use a smokescreen to exit the battle, and surprise attack Doppelganger immediately. Its HP will not have recovered at all, so Sleep Near can have it again. Repeat until you're out of Sleep Near charges, and even with the regenerating stats, it should be close to death. This final round you should unleash a Demon Awakening just to quickly spam magic attacks. Though, before you go, make sure everyone in the party knows magic attacks. I teach all my party members every basic magic skill, but that might seem too costly for some players. And if the doppelganger is somehow still standing after that, chain attacks are your friends. Especially if your party members are set to spam their skill library. You'll need to kill doppelgangers at least 5 times by the end of the third game, so this will not be the last encounter. But you only get the key item, the Own King, by beating it your first time right here in Rebirth. Second is the Abyss quest. Periodically through the games, players on the forums will give you area words for free just from their postings. Other times, you will be prompted to write in a response from some defaulted options. Whenever one pops up, which gives you an option that equates to, please give us the area words, do it. The Abyss quest, unlike everything else, is a chain of events you need to catch in succession to properly unlock. And, like the doppelganger, these all build off one another, so missing any in the chain results in you losing the next. Each of these encounters involve vital vistas, trying to revive the god of death, Sernunos who, in R2, is effectively the devil. However, due to the nature of Skaith in the system, the event has locked itself to Haseo exclusively, the NPCs branding him and taking his life force to revive their dark god. In the post-game, a quest flags to take him on an Indigo Lu, where Haseo first saw Ida. And it is not an easy battle, for Sir Nunos has over 4,000 hit points. And I know that seems like a pitiful amount after all the time with the Fablanova Crystallis bullcrap, but it's rare at this point in the game to have monsters with more than a thousand. Hell, most player characters at the game's level cap are barely over that. And at best, using his twin blades, Haseo will be doing 50 points of damage per strike. 
Which makes this encounter more difficult is Adelie, the only player that can learn a healing spell better than Repth, is unavailable at that time, and while the dedicated healing option does improve survivability with less incompetent NPC party members, it's just not the same. So I usually go with Kuhn because of the Steam Gunner's range support, and Syllabus as we've invested the most time at this point developing his Blade Brandier's job skills and micromanaging healing myself. From the battle we get some more stat books, but it's the last encounter needed to max out the real books for Volume 1 once you've collected all of the other items, which is the other outstanding issue. Between guild shops, quests, side quests, and item customization, it's usually last, as not counting Beekman, their requisites are effectively marking off a checklist. Getting the chims, encountering Mechagrunty, finding the lucky animals, killing the blacklist PKs and thinning their number. Pretty much everything else can be worked on at the same time. As I've said before, there's no reason not to do it. The rewards aren't always the best, but it's something with some value that can give you an advantage. Back to the main story, it's time for the title match with Endrance, getting another third-person omniscient scene of Saku mindlessly praising Endrance, saying she'll take care of him so he won't have to. But Endrance sees through it. She's afraid for him. And... Aww. But if I don't do anything, you'll never recognize me, Master Ren. Remember this, this will pay off later. Haseo and Endrance trade barbs, the latter confident that she is with them. Oban is also there, to reinforce Haseo's purpose. Something that will drive him constantly, he's lost perspective of in his quest for power. The pair quickly invoke Maha and Scaith, and this is where the truth comes about. While I spoiled Endrance's identity and his relationship to Maha, really, anyone that knows the franchise guessed that straight away. But this is really where it hits that emotional impact, their exchanges in Avatar form broken as he laments her loss and what he's done to try and get her back. But all he sees is that cat. And that's not Maha. That's not Mia. Aseo and Endrance are the same because they strive for what is lost to them. How they differ is what they do to gain it back. Aseo turned it outwards and has only suffered through it for half a year, while Endrance turned it inwards and bore through it for nearly two years. I shall become strong for you. He is strong enough to protect you. Ah, I was so happy then. She is simply she. Because you were my only friend. Because you were all I wanted. But it's fine now. She has returned. Just go away. To me, you're nothing but ugly dolls. Don't interfere with me. I do not want to be alone anymore. I don't want to lose anything. Ever again! Like Magus, Maha could generate a shield made of flower petals and also damaging projectiles and massive curved shuriken. Its seductive voice can paralyze and damage Scathe. Data Drain manifests from the bottom of Maha. Weird connotations there. However, after Scaith devours its third phase, the cat he cared for, Endrance believing to be Maha, is revealed to be Ida. Conflicting statements abound whether this made it retreat or caused it to be destroyed, as it really didn't infect Endrance. It acted as a companion. Still, the mystery remains why. And with what he believed to be Mia gone, the fight completely leaves Endrance. Crowning Team Haseo, Emperors of the Arena. Well, they will be. The official ceremony is held in another Lost Ground, High Brazil, which is only accessible from the docks of Makanu with invite. Well done. Wait, seriously? That's it? Dude, I'm level 50. I collected a bunch of those a while back and stopped using them because I have the Ripper's Blades. No 5-star equipment at all? Nothing? What a chip. And now you have to socialize. Ugh. Personally, I'm with Haseo on that. 
Talking to people you barely know and or tolerate in large groups can be more terrifying than the terror of death. However, it seems that there's a special guest who approaches Adelie. Ovan returns to his true role, teasing Adelie with knowledge best left alone. And this ties back to the beginning of how they met and how they've interacted since. Shino used the same character that you do. Understand what that means. And she draws her own conclusions. Because they're not entirely wrong. God, I'm such an idiot! No matter what, there's no reason for this. If you won't look at me. We'll get more into this in Reminisce, but to Adelie, that is the most insulting thing you could possibly do to her. But before that, Ovan told Adelie a secret. Syllabus lets us know that the argument from way back had farther reaches than we've seen. She's been hurting for some time, and she decided to act on it. For that secret is she has a power that just might find Triage for Haseo. Which draws the attention of Yada. For much like Haseo, Adelie is an unawakened Epitaph user. They didn't know until recently. But with her emotionally compromised state, she's a danger to herself and the status of the system. And they need to activate the signs to follow her. Pai and Kuhn come with, this is non-negotiable, and the sign leads them to a creator's room, where everything that's divided them comes out. I want you to look at me! I want you to see me! Recognize me! Simply, Adelie? Because he can't see you beyond everything you hide behind. When you walk your own path with your own feet, when you grasp your fate with your own hands, when you see the world with your own eyes and listen with your own ears, and from your own points of view shout to the world, I exist with your own words, do you become real to all who meet you? Adelie speaks with others' words, holds herself to the fates of others, sees and hears through the veil of others' views, and because of this, Haseo can only see that face as belonging to Shino, the facets of herself that align with that other. He's tried not to, but he can't help it. And it hurts him to see someone so alike and yet unlike her be there and walk down the same path with someone so unworthy of her affections. In the face of pain, he would rather push away when she would grasp harder. Ultimately, she hasn't done anything to make him see beyond the cleric's character model. Despite her desires, she hasn't let anyone see the real her beyond the mirage of deceit. But before this can be settled between them, before the truth can be laid bare, Adelie succeeds despite herself. The Pursuer has come. This time, Haseo tries interrogating him, but he just stands there. But with allies he can trust and power he now understands, it's different this time. I won't let you. You won't get away again! Give us back all of the lost ones! But he's demanding the impossible. The first thing you'll notice is the name. Kite. If you imported the data unlock from Quarantine, the name changes to reflect whatever you named Kite at the beginning of the core games. Yes, I know what you're thinking. That is one piece of the greater puzzle I have hinted at again and again. This is not Tri-Edge. However, the games will suffer this misconception for quite some time. This is Azure Kite, a stitched together reincarnation assembled from the lost character data of Kite's PC and given free ranged autonomy. And it hunts Ida. Azure Kite shifts between barely moving and swift action, easily able to wound an unprepared party replicating itself in special attacks and leaving behind a mark similar to the signs, because the games aren't ready to give that secret away, even though they already have. However, as its hit points are depleted and its structure breaks down, it has one last backup plan. Drain arc on the environment to absorb data, and forge an avatar body. The Azure Flame God is a difficult enemy, firing blasts in rapid succession and creating another set of spinning discs, similar to those in Avatar battles. It also likes to get up close and personal for major damage. Unlike the limited bracelet, the Avatar's version of Data Drain takes up the entire body, reinformatting until that's all it is. 
and as a consequence, removing that power with an opposing drain collapses it. And not just the Avatar, Kite itself is shattered. And nothing has been obtained once again. I... I... However, that entity came here for a reason. Adelie! And this is how Rebirth ends, with the audience wanting to know what happens next. Rebirth starts us off strong, introducing the principal players as well as reintroducing the protagonist and his journey. For those coming in, you're tantalized by the mystery of the realm and the motivations, and if you somehow bore through roots to come to this, you see what little influence lingers in the actions of those they bothered to keep who were actually fucking relevant. The gameplay is fun and honors the legacy of the original games, while allowing for innovation in all of its principal aspects, improving them on every level. The side quests, bar Beekman, are easy to do with little alteration in actions. Items are simple to obtain. The difficulty is pulling up the right character interactions and leveling up your skills. However, it's not perfect. The storyline quests are too adamant to adhering to its trigger windows, limiting explorations of parts of the game, such as more arena battles, or allowing us to do quests and summon companions. It wants you at this level, no others with little excess. A player that likes to be two or three levels above a story event to compensate for my own lack of skill as a gamer, it can grate at times. Furthermore, there's far less mystery and reward at exploration. A few secret items like you find in the core games would not have been a bad idea. Maybe have the keys to them sequestered in the forums. We're likewise very limited in the types of characters we can recruit, limited to six companions, and none of them bearing commonalities in weapons. With the expanded job class roster, this was expected, opposing the repetitive six of the original, but there are no optional companions. Everyone is story relevant, they just don't always tie together. As I've stressed, the designs of the characters, while good and fitting the in-game game, are consistently ruined by minor elements to them that just throw them off entirely. For Haseo, it's the rear adornments, especially anything hanging pointlessly off his ass. For Kun and Adelie, it's their head adornments. Pi, well, Pi's character model in its entirety. Yada and Gaspard could use freaking shirts. Pyrrhos could have had his armor a few sage darker, and Alkay doesn't need that giant fan on her back. Or the Ahoge that just confuses anyone not familiar with its purpose, or annoy those that do with respect to her character. And furthermore, the various sides that are just now being introduced are too antagonistic for their own good. Yes, necessary for the arc Haseo will come to bear, but we will see little of the other forces Haseo's pissed off. The most we see is Bordeaux representing the PKs, and while she makes for a good early antagonist, it putters out. Oh, she's not gone, but that's for another time. Regardless, Haseo's actions throughout this will continue to be relevant, as well the motivations behind them as he comes to see his actions in new lights. The character dynamics start here will continue to build, and the secrets I've kept will come in time as his journey continues. But would it surprise you to learn that everything I've presented was only 25 hours of gameplay? 25 hours for all of this. Now, most of the games I do on RPG Hell necessitate upwards of 50 hours just for the playthrough I record footage for. And yet, every dot .hat game averages a little over 20 hours. I take more time to watch a Kamen Rider series, and each of them individually story-wise rivals any of the other titles I've done on RPG Hell in far less time. I guess it's just me, but more than 40 to 60 hours in an RPG is where it starts to become excessive, as commonly there isn't enough to support running longer than that, instead the developers choosing to pad it with frivolities, slow combat formats, and leveling the characters at a snail's pace. This isn't a problem here, and thus slashes down the time needed to complete it majorly. .hack knows what story it wants to tell, and as each part of it is sequestered into segments that are more easily digestible, 
and allowing for breaks while keeping things focused. Just look at the original ones. Part 1, learning what's going on after stumbling across the danger. Part 2, discovering the real scope of the threat and its principal players. Part 3, uniting everyone to begin the counterattack. And Part 4, bringing things to their conclusion. They're interconnected, they build off each other, and the other media in the franchise, while establishing everything important as they go, and leaving you wanting more. And with Rebirth, its job was to re-establish the setting and get us to connect with the people within the world. The biggest problem from the story being split like this is Bandai extorts more money out of you to see it to its next part or conclusion. And that's not something I can defend, considering each game originally retailed for $50. Really, it's all the more why Bandai should consider an HD collection for these games. I'd buy it! Copies of Dot .hack media are exceedingly rare and coveted, and are expensive as a result. My copies are going to wear eventually, so it's something I keep in mind. Hell, when I was done with Roots, I sold it for 100 bucks. I got that set for 20 In a month's time, we'll return to the series with the next volume, Reminisce, and how what happens to Adelie will cascade and change everything the GU team knows about the threats they face and the people they have put their faith in. See you then.